Welcome to NFL Daily, where we're not waiting until November to uh, make some big trades. Uh-uh. I'm here in the Chris Wessling Podcast Studio with my friends, Colleen Wolf and Jordan Rodrigue of The Athletic. Yes, welcome to NFL Daily, presented by DoorDash, of course. And uh, where I are told, you going? I'm just rolling around here. <laughs> I'm losing my mind How are you on doing? jet lag. I'm doing great. <laughs> but uh, I told the NFL offices, I was like, give me, give me a shot of adrenaline coming into this show. I need the energy. So they made some big time trades happen. Oh, Greg did this. This was Greg. Greg, uh, can, can we just talk about like how impressive your schedule has been over the last few no. days? I kind of need days. to know the details. Like, yeah. Why? Did you Don't. Land? It's not, we how have Devontae Adams sleep? being You're traded. You're a machine, Greg. You're we a have machine. Amari Cooper being how traded. How are you functioning right now? We have a uh, TNF preview okay. with Sean okay. Payton. But but answer this. Yes. When did you When did you land? When did you get back from London? Like five o'clock or so. I was watching the, the first quarter of the game on the on the way home. We did the uh, recap show last night. The, you, did, the, you did the recap show. We last did the night? recap show. You haven't All listened. Right, get out of here. It's great analysis. Me and Nick shook. Um, yeah, we're back. We, London. That's old news. That was that was what forty eight hours. Setting a dangerous precedent for everyone else coming back from international. I know travel. that was not that was not the plan. Listen, I don't care. You're not gonna like that I say this. I'm sorry. And close your ears if you need to. But like watching you work over this last week because you're also consuming other podcasts. You're also prepping for every single daily show. The I know machine. you're, he's like, he's shriveling in embarrassment yes. right now. Cause he, he hates this, but like, I am so amazed by what you just accomplished. Oh, Greg. Week. So I, thank you for like, Make, making the bar so high for the rest of us that we can never, that I'm not really yeah. thrilled about. No, but, but in, in all earnestness, Greg, like, Hell yeah, dude. You're doing I, great. I appreciate it. And yeah, coming back this side, it, if I could have scheduled the days differently, that would be <laughs> that would like, be perfect. In hindsight, I hated the... <laughs> no, I hated no, no, I loved it. But the, sun, <laughs> the Sunday schedule, doing the game at Tottenham to the Sky Studios and then doing this this show, the NFL Daily Show, deep into the night. That's one of the most fun days that, that I'll ever have working, getting on a motorcycle. We need a GoPro what? next time. One I of our picture. One of our sh- one of our shadowy league fi- figures, actually, I saw, and you know, a couple of them have come to me like we wouldn't have been bold enough to get on get on that motorcycle flying through traffic to get the sky by the kickoff. It was fun. That's fun. It was fun. <laughs> I that, love that. Colleen would have definitely. You're done like that. Jason Bourne out here. Colleen. I, to be yes. fair, Colleen would have jumped off a building, yeah. parachuted into the See, next we're talking. I totally would have. <laughs> I wish I could. Someone bring me that opportunity. I, I, I'm like Jason Bourne. Yeah, if Jason Bourne was like 5'6 and 140 pounds. Nothing will get you more conscious of your size as a small man <laughs> than watching Love is Blind on your downloads on the way back from London. It's just like everyone, when they're about to see them, you're just like, I hope he's not small. We got to have love is blind, but it's just like a bunch of small guys scoring like statuesque women and see what happens. Let's go and talk about some news. Oh my God. <laughs> I would kill it on love is blind, by the way. I would like win them Short over game. and then he'd be, Short then they'd be yeah. like, what the hell? Uh, you know who is happy with what was behind the door uh, oh. when they opened it up this morning? Jets fans, like behind that love is blind door was a silhouette of Devontae Adams. He arrived Mm. in New York, New Jersey, Monday night, maybe before the Monday night football game even happened. And then we learned on Tuesday, rather, that the Raiders are trading Devontae Adams to the Jets for a conditional third round pick in 2025. I want to let you know the conditions because it makes it pretty obvious that it's likely to stay a third round pick. The Jets have to either make the AFC title game or Super Bowl or Devontae Adams has to be a first or second team all pro, both of which are very unlikely. The Jets making it that far would be more likely because we're we're in week seven here we're entering, and Devontae Adams hasn't played half the weeks, and his numbers weren't good. So you're probably not getting to second team all pro. That means they picked up a great receiver for the a mid third round pick, Colleen, and yet like no one seems happy about it. People say, oh, this is all oh, the Jets doing Jets things again. I'm like What am I missing? I think it's good. I I think think it's it's smart. It's great for us just from a sheer entertainment value. I mean, him going to the Jets, there's no better place he could have gone. This is amazing. Going with Aaron Rodgers in New York with that media scene. 
and a team that's two and four, the only thing like they're really winning right now is all of our attention. <laughs> and it seems to happen every single Tuesday. It's very see you next Tuesday of them, the name of our text chain. Um, and yeah, I, it's there's winners and losers on both sides. And I feel like Garrett Wilson is both a winner mm, and a loser interesting. in this trade because he's the most targeted man in football. And this will now sort of... Things will ease up on him, but that will maybe allow more opportunities for him to have positive plays. But obviously, he's not going to be the number one guy. And how does that chemistry work in a locker room that's filled with big personalities? He was complaining about what was going on in the offense before any yeah. of this happened. Now he's got a guy who has like a mind lock with Aaron Rodgers. But I think it's ultimately positive. Good point about the winners of this trade being... See you next Tuesday. You know, yeah. NFL Daily. I didn't right? even think about that, that I the Robert Sala trade was went. the last time. Robert, or the Robert Sala, Sala trade. <laughs> you're just going to have to be forgiving no, I love of this, me Greg. on this show. <laughs> but you're you're absolutely right that, that we were here for that one. And it is funny how after every crushing Jets loss, they just completely flip the narrative bef like before 24 hours are even up so that uh -huh. everyone can be like, well, now it's a fresh start. We're starting all over. It's like that loss never My even God. happened. It's like you can get bangs. You can get a revenge body, but you're still going to be two and four. <laughs> right. But if they lose to the Steelers this week, it's like, what what more can they do? I don't <laughs> think they can do many more things, but I, I thought it was a, I think it is a smart gambit it by is. the Jets. What I do could, you think? I couldn't help thinking that not only was this, First of all, the move that needed to happen, it's been in the works even before this last loss. You could tell with the timeline of everything that this was something that was a priority for this team to get done, regardless of whether they were going to win or lose on Monday Night Football. After, Especially after firing Robert Sala, like, you have to do something like this. You're basically pushing everything in on saying we are going to rebuild, or not rebuild, but give the quarterback the things that he wants, the things that he needs. Devontae Adams being a huge one of those things. I also think that it, it's a uh, chips are on the table. We're going to try to push Woody Johnson is saying such things at the league meetings this week. And we'll tee up the sound in a second, but it's also, this makes the job vacancy look better. It makes this job mm. in general, the with, job with all vacancy of its, what, for next year, for next year, look, wow. look better. And, and I do want to point out too, How? because, well, I mean, if you can keep some of this intact, let's say you don't get oh, as yeah. far as you want, because you have had this chaos right in the middle of the season, but you believe you're now on the right track and the right structure. You're extending some timelines here. It does having weapons on this offense and promising somebody, especially an offensive minded coach. And I, I love Ulbrich. I think he's a great coach, but saying, Hey, you can come in and we already have this here for you. Um, if you can basically be amenable to work with, with the quarterback, if he decides that's going to be in the, in the equation for him too, this does make this job look a little bit better than it did three days ago. Uh, or, or even, you know, last week when we first got the news of the Robert Sala firing and also wanted to point out that Ian Rappaport was reporting that he, that Devonte Adams and the jets have agreed to a restructure mm -hmm. even. So not only are you getting him for, for this amount, which is, way better than probably what the, the Raiders would have wanted. We're kind of putting out there that they would be agreeable to. Well, they're not paying any money. So that was the part of it. I yeah. guess the Jets somewhat compromised. But then the Jets get a restructure out of it too. Right. But the, the restructure is just this year, like kind of spreading it around. And he wasn't making that much money anyways. He was making $17 million this year. So they just owe that salary essentially for the rest of the season. And they, they shuffled it around the next two years. He is on the books for $35.6 million in each season. I've, Yes, he probably will want more guaranteed money coming into it, but I kind of look at that. And I was like, well, that's about right. That That's about yeah. what a Devontae Adams would cost. So I, I think it's a good point that it's not necessarily just a rental. If Aaron Rodgers is going to keep playing football next exactly. year, it is probably going to be with Devontae Adams as his teammate. And I keep going back to a mid third round pick. So let's listen to the sound that you very professionally teased getting better every week uh woody johnson <laughs> at the league meetings explaining why he did it salvageable we're gonna kick you know you can add the words after that no we're gonna we're gonna do really well we're gonna do well <laughs> salvage is the end but this is the beginning you know thinking is overrated <laughs> you, know, you have to look forward we have to look forward to the games we're gonna play at each and every week and, uh, and try to win all of them, and that's basic stuff, right? 
are you confident? I was saying tell, tell, tell a day and night. You've heard of that? Yeah. From that one scene, he said, you're not a thinker. You're a driver. Yeah. Right? Well, that's what you want to hear about, about the person like making the biggest decisions. Like a passionate love scene in Talladega Nights. Ricky Bobby is not a thinker. <laughs> I, a I love intense. that. <laughs> I, well, I think it, that was prefaced by a question that said, well, the thinking is that you're going to do this. And so he's pushing back. He's going with instincts. He's extremely confident. Now, that's, been, that's one of the reasons why Robert Sala doesn't have a job is the expectations were so high because there's so much confidence and everyone's buying it. Rogers seemed, well, he was in a great mood on the McAfee show and everyone's talking up Brick, Jeff Ulbrick, and you almost wouldn't know that this team is no. two and four. Now, I don't think uh, Woody Johnson is on the DVOA future schedule rankings like I am, but the Jets <laughs> do have the easiest schedule in the entire NFL, according to... DVOA for the rest of the season. And they've had the sixth hardest so far. So when you do look at the schedule, especially once you get past this week at Pittsburgh, there is some reason to believe, and you saw the offense play pretty well on Monday night, that this and team hurts. Yeah, this team has some has some winning left to sure, do. Sure, for sure. But I mean, they also need to figure out the Hassan Reddick of it all, too. And I guess Drew Rosenhaus was at the game last night. There's just so much that is happening with this team. And they had the primetime game. It was a game that was super frustrating. Obviously, Devontae Adams today, the midseason firing last week, and now Hassan Reddick changing agents and being given a 48-hour window for a trade to be figured out. There's just so much happening in New York at once. Maybe they get a deal done with Reddick soon, and Woody Johnson alluded to it in that press conference saying that this was our week to make big moves. Like, and he essentially said more big moves are coming. What, what other big moves could there be? Ago, now. Right. So you can maybe get, <laughs> you can maybe get the p- p- pick back that you sent for Devonte Adams. And let's just talk about Devonte Adams for a second, because I've seen some commentary that, well, you know, he's in the decline phase of his career. You're not going to get better trading for older players. And so I went back and I watched his, a lot of his targets and his snaps from this year. And Devontae Adams is excellent. Mm-hmm. Devontae Adams yeah. is still a top 10 receiver. Devontae Adams is possibly, when he's on the field, still a top five receiver. So I, I thought this was a great move for the price that they sent, which, again, it, you're not going to get that conditional to move it up from a third to a second. We can assume that Jets are somewhere in the middle of the third round. This is a mid-third round pick for either half a season or a season and a half of a top 10 receiver. That is more than fair. You should see the third round picks that they've made in the Joe Douglas era in the third round picks, just the average third round pick that is out there. People get so worked up about, oh, you can't trade him for a second. You can't trade him for a third. Half those picks just don't work. And I know there's value in controlling costs and you just don't want to give it away. But those picks are being given away willy nilly. Once you get into the draft, it's like, Hey, we want to move up 10 spots in the third. We'll give up a third. Like that's, that's what's happening there. And so to me, I think it makes sense for what I believe is a known commodity, which is Devontae Adams playing with Aaron Rodgers. We know Aaron Rodgers is at his best with guys who understand how he's thinking. That's why Alan Lazard in 2024 is a completely different and better player than Alan Lazard was in 2023. Devontae Adams is one of the best route runners in the entire yes. league. So this is going to make Aaron Rodgers so much happier. The one thing I still worry about with this team is the offensive line. They make mistakes in singular spurts. Like they they just don't feel like they're playing together as a full unit when they make a mistake. It is one guy compounding mistakes or it is penalties, one guy or two guys at any given time compounding errors. I did like, though, Todd Downing as the play caller. He put together a nice little pressure mitigation script to open up a couple of those series, including running the ball more, including looking more balanced. I just think that not only does Devontae Adams adding back into the mix give you more options with some of those pressure beater route concepts that they, including the, some of those quick slants in, in breakers and outbreakers they're using in the beginning of the game. But also it just spreads everyone out a little bit wider. So you're not feeling so clenched and compressed mm. as an offense in general. You have some breathing room. And, and I think that to your point, Greg, earlier, it, it is usually generally with the mean of teams, it is not generally sound practice to overinvest in veterans on the other side of a certain number of years. However, this is not a team that believes it is functioning in the mean. This is a team that 
quite literally gathered pieces in order to make a push. And so now if you commit to that, you can't sit in the gray area, you can't sit in the halfway zone. You know, there's a lot of chaos around the Jets right now. But one thing that I do think is the correct thing to do is to continue to push along the art, the commitments that you've already made yeah. and, and the, the, um, the ethos that you've already decided you're going to have, not change your entire build structure just because you fired the head coach. Right. Cause, so I, again, I saw like get, getting put some pushback on Twitter that this wasn't a good trade. It's like, they're not going to go anywhere. They're not going to win. It's like, yeah, I actually agree with that. I don't think they're going to get the second round pick because I don't think they're going to make the conference title game. Trading for Devontae Adams does not change it enough for me, but I'm looking at this trade in a vacuum. They've already decided this is the strategy. And after deciding this is the strategy for this year, everyone's all in. The, the GM could be gone. It's an older team. You only have Rodgers for this year and maybe next year, whatever it's going to be. In that vacuum, I think it makes total sense because you mentioned it like they're, they're a receiver group now that with Lazard as a three and Garrett Wilson as a two, it's a fun group. I think they have issues on their offensive line. I didn't have them. Okay, so the I have a question the about season. the offensive yes. line. And I feel like you brought that up like five minutes ago and I've been thinking about it ever mm. since. So with this offensive line, because obviously last night with Todd Downing, they mixed it up a little mm -hmm. bit more and ran the ball, which was something that we haven't seen this season. But the week before when they were playing the Vikings in London, uh, Aaron Rodgers dropped back 54 times in that game for the offensive line. At some point, aren't they fatigued because they're pl they're going backwards. It's mm. way easier to play going forwards. Like when you're, when you're run blocking, just from that standpoint, I would think being mixing things up with the run game that might help the offensive line just a little bit because of that fatigue factor. Yeah. You're what they were doing was allowing pretty much any defense to stay in their A plus pass rush plan, which yeah. just means because of what you said, and then a bunch of other circumstances of what that looks like structurally, you are basically facing the, the most arduous and ex extraneous amount of pressure that you possibly can, because if you don't have dimension, because you're not running the ball the way that they were able to a little bit last mm -hmm. night, it was their best result. running game of the season. Yeah, yeah. And, and like, and he looked, and he looked more like himself than he has and certainly produced like that. But and, and there was more balance. And again, getting some of the quick screens going, getting some of the quick slants in the passing game going, widens out the defense a little bit more. You're accounting for those areas of space on the field for, for the defenders. And then now you're able to, because you have a little bit wider space up front, you're able to run the ball through that space and it's, the blocking becomes easier. So it all fits together when you have just like that one extra layer, but knowing what to do with it, Colleen, which is the point you're making, knowing what to do with that extra piece in order to alleviate some of the stress and like tightness that you're feeling, some of the errors, some of the 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 completely whiffed blocks because you're not letting a team stay in their A-plus pressure plan against you. Um, it's a ripple effect, having him on the field, but using him in the right way. Playing way easier teams, playing the easiest schedule. Right. Like, like, everything is amazing. Like Everything's everything amazing. Looks, looks amazing when you just suddenly start playing like bad teams. Like the bears are amazing now uh -huh. because they have four wins over like one win teams and, and play a bunch of bad defenses. It, the schedule really does explain a lot. That a little bit. I mean, yeah. I'm just saying, you know what I mean though? Like it, it, it helps a lot. And I think they, they need to make the playoffs. We'll see if they do poor Mike Williams, who was thrown under the Ooh. bus a little bit by Aaron Rodgers in that post game Twice. press conference. And then also on McAfee today, Wally was on okay. McAfee or a little bit after, like sometime in the same area, Jordan Schultz of Fox Sports reported that Mike Williams could be available in a trade, which just unfortunate. I wonder, I know it's a different scheme, but the Chargers, like, just give up like a conditional sixth for Mike Williams it's all and pay for him. Toward your, uh, Oh, that's good. Yeah. I haven't even mentioned the segment that's coming up because we have so much news <laughs> to get to. The segment is stuff that will change. Like we're we're in one mode of the season, but the whole league is going to be so different by the time There's we chapters get to, get to December. And these teams that made moves today, um, they're so different already than they were, what, 24 hours ago. I just want to, before we wrap up this part of the show, the Jets part, just want to say the last two seasons that Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams played together. Granted, they were younger men. They were, they were different men. They Devontae Adams averaged 159 targets over 1,450 yards and 14 touchdowns in those wow. two seasons. And yeah, the, I think he's just going to feel so much more comfortable knowing what Devontae Adams is going to do, but 
Then even, again, Devontae Adams thought it was going to be great to play with Derek Carr, and that didn't work. And Rodgers is stacking friends. Sorry. Yeah, you know he Go is. Ahead. He totally is. <laughs> it's fine. It's not even a great point, but it was just going to be them in their subprime is an improvement. Mm. That is that good. is a good point. And All I, right. I mentioned the third round picks that Joe Douglas has made that everyone's in such an up in arms that they would dare to give away. Uh, Chumu, Chuma Adogo, uh, who's now with the Cowboys, Ashton Davis, Jabari Zuniga, Jeremy Ruckert, halfway decent um, tight end for them, and Malachi Corley. Those are those are their third round picks in the Joe Douglas era. Just just saying, people don't need to go too crazy about that. Let's go crazy about the other big time trade. On Tuesday, Amari Cooper is a member of the Buffalo Bills. Mm. He is going there essentially for a third round pick. The Browns, the, you know, those dirty dogs, they somehow <laughs> got they somehow got the Bills to give them back a, a pick swap, a sixth for a seventh uh, on the way in return. So like they actually are mo- the the Bills are moving up from the seventh to the sixth round and getting Amari Cooper here. And so I just am imagine when I say the, those dirty dogs, I mean, I can just imagine the trade was essentially done and they're like, it'll really be done if you give us more than that. And the, and the Browns are just like, God, I guess we really, really don't want Amari Cooper on our team. I think it makes sense for both parties. Amari Cooper in a different situation than Devonte Adams, because he is in a contract year. So that's a, interesting element that on paper it looks like a rental but once you have him in the building you have more control you could always franchise tag him next year you certainly could re-sign him early we saw the bills last night not really get their wide receivers involved too much certainly on the outside and amari cooper would certainly seem to help out a a group that's given some concern for bills fans what do you think connie I mean, I just love the answer from the Bills to the Jets Mm. with first it's Devontae Adams. (laughs) Now it's Amari Cooper. And I just wish that I was privy to all of the behind the scenes workings, all of the phone calls that were going between the GMs and the agents and the players. But in terms of this addition to Buffalo, I guess everybody doesn't have to eat now because that was their mantra. Everybody eats spreading the ball around. I mean, Keon Coleman, he's not a number one wide receiver, but he's a great compliment to have. So this is going to be add so much another layer, like uh, Jordan was saying, to the offense in general. But I think it was smart of them because they obviously had a very little cap space. This deal worked perfectly because Cleveland converted the majority of Cooper's $20 million base into a signing bonus. So that was why the Bills were able to afford this. And yeah, Greg, they had to give up that third round pick, but also they still have the pick that they acquired from the Stefan Diggs trade, an extra 2025 20, second rounder. So they they really do win out in this. Right. Yeah, and the contract's less than a million. I love this move. This was in part because selfishly, this was going to be a part of my entrance to this oh, segment. Oh, no way. Yeah, where I, I thought I said my this could change would be the Bills roster because mm. I felt like they really learned and faced some hard truths about themselves <laughs> over the last couple of weeks. And I think some of it was figuring out if things could work with that receiver core and, and what how they were going to deploy everybody. But then just seeing that it just wasn't going to work. I love when a team is honest with itself, about itself, and then moves to activate those changes and, and sort of like fix it, fix itself, you know, in the, I can fix some era of, of the bills. And, and I think that, um, it, you could see this in the last couple of weeks in these games, um, defenses had no fear of their receivers. They were oh. playing man so much against these receivers. Um, again, last, uh, excuse me, Monday night, even the rotational corners on the jets were in man, uh, against this receiver core over 50% of their coverage staffs. No, there was a not a huge sample size because Josh Allen only threw the ball 25 times. But still, there was no no fear about this. They weren't threatening defenses. They were having difficulty layering concepts in order to spring each other open in different ways. And so I, I love this. This opens up so much. Again, it spreads the field a little bit wider. It adds an actual threat that will dictate certain coverages towards a number one, a bona fide number one receiver. Once he gets his feet under him, he gets his rhythm. And I also love that the Bills are starting to lean more into an identity that doesn't necessarily have to depend 
on the bas- the passing game. They're loading up in heavier personnel sets. Ray Davis, welcome I Ray know. Davis to the freaking NFL. Love to have you here, man. Like what a brilliant debut from him. I loved watching him at the Senior Bowl mm-hmm. this past year. And they are using these north to, this north to south running. They're using him in the passing game. They're using 12, 13, 20, 22 personnel, extra tight ends, even a fullback. And they're leaning on this to where they can now make this their identity and still have the multiplicity to pop out in the passing game because they can now actually, with Amari, they can actually rely on this once he gets his feet on Right. That switch to Joe Brady last year midseason was one of the best things that they ever did. A- absolutely. They they are a run first team. Josh Allen running the ball, uh, I've pointed out on the show a number of times, is the most effective play in football on like a statistical basis. Success rate, like when he runs the football, it's always successful and he helps the running game. They have a great offensive line. I think they could have won the Super Bowl before this trade. I think they have a better chance to win the Super Bowl after this trade, I don't think Amari Cooper is a number one receiver. I don't think he, he's probably been the prototype of a guy who throughout his career is in that gray area. Is Like, yes, he's a top 32 receiver. Is he a top 10 receiver? Almost never. But he's so streaky. He kind of reminds me of the poor man's T.O. in that. The, there's always a honeymoon period. But when and, you say when you say number one receiver. Yes. When I say when I say that, I'm not saying he's going to have the entirety of the target share. I'm saying this is a coverage dictate type yes. of player. That's what I'm saying. And I don't even know if he was doing that in Cleveland this year. He's looked awful. Like he's been open, but he just hasn't executed like his drops. Well, the drops What's are the con- really bad. The like, context there is not great. No, it's either. not. Yeah. But some of it when you watch, I, I did want to go watch these two guys as targets, him and Adams and the contested catches, like uncatchable balls. He's just been out of it and after a career year too. Right. So that's the thing is he he's had a really interesting career. He seems moody. I, I think he, he now he's not like what did T- you be if yes. you were there. I, there are some but, Instagram stories about when he was coming up in trade conversations. Yes. Some posts about like I'd go there, whatever, that kind of thing. I think you know, that's might be what you're referring to here. I, I'm referring to his entire career, his his career in Oakland. He was very moody, very streaky, very up and down. When he was into it, he was into it until he wasn't into it. And then he got out of it and he went to Dallas <laughs> and he immediately started playing better. He immediately started being more focused. Everything was awesome. And then after a little while in Dallas, a few years, he was very much not into it. And he was almost not unplayable at points in his last year in Dallas, but he was not into it and they were sick of him and they got rid of it. And then he gets to Cleveland and he's all, he's back into it. It's awesome. It's honeymoon. It's working. And then this season, it was again, kind of the Amari Cooper isn't happy season. So you would think they get, they we get the honeymoon. Are we, gonna, are we talking? We're talking about the bills. They are, they, of any, they're, they know how to capitalize on a yes. thing honeymoon oh God, period. Yeah. <laughs> I yes. mean, they, Jackpot. they have precedent with this. Yes. I mean, that's, I, that's what I think we're talking this about this contextually of what they believe their ceiling is. And that is Super Bowl. So, yep. Yeah, they're making this move, and they're probably depending on the honeymoon. Hell, they even had a nice uh, honeymoon period with T.O. back in the day. Now, that was really old, T.O., but if I'm if I'm just ca- <laughs> connecting it. But people forget how freaking good T.O. was. Oh, my God. That when he was 36 and 37 in Buffalo and Cincinnati for those one years, it was like, he was still sneaky, kind of awesome. I, I, I just remember how good he was on Jerry Rice Day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And, like, Philadelphia was a perfect. So, to me, he seems like the more low-key uh, maybe passive aggressive T.O. Amari Cooper. But I, I'll say that all to the point that I think it'll work T.O. out. T.O. was very Great. passive aggressive. Yeah, that's he was just aggressive really aggressive different. occasionally, yeah, but yes. I love how you're existing in multiple time zones at one time as you're sitting there yes. still connecting these dots. Like, it's that's incredible. Really impressive. Now, if if we trust Next Gen Stats average separation as a, a meaningful stat, which I'm not sure. Do you sh- not trust it? What's happening? That stat, there? I'm not sure. I think it really is dependent on scheme team season there's a lot that i think goes into it but for what it's worth amari cooper uh, average separation this year is higher than it's been since 2018 it's a positive. Well, he certainly separated from the browns there you go <laughs> um 22 million dollars in dead money on the browns books for next year for amari cooper so everyone who's saying hey they did a great job they gave up a fifth for amari cooper you got so much value out of him absolutely true like the the analytical way to look at this was they they did a great job with this quote unquote asset and they got a third round pe- pick back here and that that's solid but they still do have 
Deshaun Watson and Amari Cooper on the books next year for a hundred million dollars. And I don't think either of them are going to be helping that team. So that's like, from a Browns perspective, it did make me think, well, where are like, they're in a, they're in a weird spot right now. They're one in five. Are they going to go into full tank mode? If you were going into full tank mode, is that a reason to keep playing Deshaun Watson? I'm just saying, like, would you not want Jameis Winston to go in there and get wins? I would love That's to dark, see Jameis Winston. But, and it's craven, and it's, like, calculated, and it's cynical. Like, if they would make Deshaun Watson keep playing in order to lose. But this is the team that ignored everything about Deshaun Watson to sign Deshaun Watson. So I don't know. I wouldn't put anything past this organization. Two more quick, very quick points yes. I want to make on the Bills, too. Still, one of the biggest concerns I have with them is something that's popped up all year. And I love that they made this move, even though it quietly wasn't necessarily their biggest need, which was a getting some defensive backs back healthy. Teron Johnson um, really settled in and made that huge play on Monday night at the end of the game. But then also they allowed 15 non-penalty plays of 10 plus yards. A lot of that is struggling to tackle in the defensive backfield. A lot of that is just just these holes that are happening against this Bobby Babich, uh, Sean McDermott defense. And so, but what I love on the counter, what I love about this team is that they were like, all right, well, we're just going to not play close games anymore. We're going to try to do whatever we can to lean into this identity with and be a running team with multiplicity, but also find a player, go, go out and get a player, not necessarily one of our larger needs, but a player who we know is going to shift coverage after we've faced this difficult reality about our current receiver core. We're just not going to play close games anymore. Solves a lot of problems at once because uh, they can play ball control with their run game. They also won't necessarily need to depend on their kicker as much. They need (laughs) to get a new kicker. Tyler Bass has been missing kicks for a while. He's had a nice run in Buffalo, but sometimes the run is just over. It's interesting. You don't think it's one of their bigger needs. I, I, I love. No, this no, Bills I team. do think it was one of their bigger needs. I'm just saying my greater concern watching their this defense can just be overly porous at yeah, times. Yeah, the back keep, seven, especially keep other teams in games. I do think receive. Like I said at the very top of this, I do think facing that truth about how teams were playing their receiver, going out and giving a getting a coverage dictation guy, that was really crucial. They are the number three offense according to DVOA after mm-hmm. six weeks. So it's not like they've been struggling. Offensively, but I think the highs of the first three weeks, yeah, they the were bills going are away. something that will change. They they will change in Amari For Cooper. The yeah, Amari <laughs> Cooper is going to help them out a lot. It all makes a little more sense. Shakir and Kincaid as a two and a three, and then Perfect. the other receivers now just kind of helping out as role players. Keon Coleman, a little less Matt Collins. That play by Matt Collins might have been the, just like the Mike Williams play was like the one you remember. That play by Mike Collins where he didn't flatten out oh. and couldn't get the touchdown it was like okay, we need to bring in. Amari Cooper. And it was a great response because I don't think there's any wide receivers else available. That might have been why they responded so quickly. It was like Devante and Cooper. I, I went and tried to look to come up with who could be available at wide Who's receiver. Christian Kirk, maybe. Uh huh. He's, he's due a lot of money, but Christian Kirk, maybe Tyreek Hill in a in a different world where he things get he wild. So. Yeah. He doesn't think so. He likes Miami. Deontay Johnson, the Panthers say they're not going to trade Deontay Johnson and they want to sign him long term, which makes sense to me, but he could be someone. Not many people available. All right. One more big item today were, was the Steelers. Now, it's not official. Mike Tomlin is not saying that he's going to start Russell Wilson on Sunday against the Jets. I mean, it's almost like when people come up with conspiracies, the fact that this game is the Sunday night football game. Like NBC (laughs) did it again. You're getting Russell Wilson versus Devontae Adams, uh, Steelers, Jets. That is awesome. Let's listen to Mike Tomlin basically justifying a quarterback change, even though for now he won't announce a quarterback change. Our Ian Rappaport says Russell Wilson will be getting first team reps and that the change is coming. Let's listen to Tomlin. Justin has been really good um, and we've been really good at times. Um, but not to be confused with great. Um, man, this is a competitive league, man. Um, we're trying to position ourselves to be that team. And uh, we got a player with talent uh, who had had an opportunity to play, so we're going to potentially explore those things. Sometimes it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what Justin has done or has not done. Hmm. I, I don't like this move. No. I, I think Justin Fields has played better this season than Russell Wilson has played since 2020. Now, you could look at Russell Wilson's stats in 2021 in that Seahawks season, though, but I remember that season. He was not playing that well despite the stats. So at, at the worst, it's it's better than he's played in a couple of years. I think he's made the surroundings look better 
than they really are. Justin Fields, that is. So I, I'm really surprised by this news. Jordan, what do you think? I'm surprised by it as well because I thought that Justin Fields, even though it's not always pretty and sometimes he takes a step back and then a couple steps forward and, you know, he still, to me, feels like he's able to play the style of football that Art Smith wants to play. And it was interesting. I'm, I'm looking for it right now. I'm scrolling uh, on my laptop here. I'm looking. There was some, some things that came out a couple weeks ago and even last week in the building, not just from comments that Art Smith made, uh, enthusiastic about coaching Justin Fields, but also players talking about how they like playing with yeah. him. So I, there seems to be, there's a subtext here that I'm not quite understanding. I, I'm, I'm certainly not understanding why this is happening now. Um, You're but not alone. I must be missing something. Not understanding. It's so <laughs> curious to me. At first, I just thought it was kind of almost like a bit that Tomlin was doing. I did too, to and be honest. I thought there's no way he's like, going to make this move. I, I, the Steelers are four and two with Fields, and Fields has, I mean, even the X factor of his legs, and I know Russell Wilson is known for that as well, but Justin Fields is different with it. And Mike Tomlin was even asked about it. Uh, and he said, like, you know, if Wilson has the same capability to use his legs as Fields, and Tomlin said, no, Justin's legs are the X factor. And it remains to be seen how the offense would change with Wilson. And then he said, I think that's one of the cute things about this discussion. <laughs> so I don't know if Mike Tomlin is just messing with all of us or what. Well, plus he had that press conference after Ian had put that report out. And then he did, you know, Tomlin did not say that Russell Wilson's the starter, that they'll both, they'll look at them both and that he could use them both. Are they going to play both? I think they could use a package of Justin Fields potentially in the red zone would not surprise me. It would kind of make sense if both quarterbacks were on board with that. And that would make this move less annoying, but it would still be annoying to me. This is Brian Botko, who covers the team for PG Sports now. So the Post-Gazette out there in Pittsburgh, I found the quote. So Steelers, this is his verbatim from his post on social media. Steelers OC Arthur Smith says, He's really enjoyed working with Justin Fields. Quote, there's no drama to him. He doesn't try to live through his avatar or create a perception. That's probably why he was so endearing to his teammates in Chicago. Extremely coachable, extremely bright. Brian Botko goes on to say, Arthur Smith also praised Justin Fields when it comes to his work ethic. Same thing as a play caller. You get in this business, people start making excuses, rationalizing, put whatever they want on social media or make sure certain narratives get leaked out. He's old school. (laughs) <laughs> well, so was that first one just a veiled shot? And yes, at Russell I am. Wilson? I don't know, but I'm double checking to make yes. sure that this account is real. I know Brian, but like that because I, when I saw that, that's a good one, and that was from October 10th. Yeah, and Justin Fields is coming off what I would say is his worst game as a starter. So it's it's funny. I did see some Steelers accounts on Sunday saying, "I wonder if this performance might make Mike Tomlin think about it," because Mike Tomlin seems like he's had a loyalty to Russell Wilson that the very hasn't top. been earned by playing experience with him, but more by their relationship. There's been some reporting alluding to almost that when he met with Russell Wilson, it was almost like a promise. Like I'm going to give you a chance to restart your career and that they had a connection there on a personal level. And almost that Tomlin, I don't know if he feels bad that just hasn't worked out for Russell Wilson. I'm not saying in his career, I mean like that he got injured and and he felt like he almost owed it to Russell Wilson to give him a chance. Cause a lot of the beat reporters, not the national guys were saying all along that this was going to happen and they've been proven right. I don't know. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I mean, maybe we will get the answer. Yeah. And Russell Wilson will look great in this offense and then we'll understand what Tomlin has been talking about this whole time. But I just don't know why we're doing it here now. It, it is very surprising. We, we wrap up the news just telling you where we will all hopefully be in 2028, which is Atlanta at the Super Bowl. Atlanta hosting Super Bowl 62. I, now I, I, I think I can read Roman numerals. Uh, 62. We're going back to Atlanta. Hopefully, again, no one no one knows uh, if we're going to be on this earth at, by that point, of course, like Kyle as Kyle Shanahan, Shanahan likes to say, <laughs> or more to how I was thinking, if we're going to still have the opportunity. You can't take these things for no. granted, but I hope to be there. Atlanta the first time around was fun. 
I loved it. I like it. The music scene is great. Um, it was a great stadium to be in. But I mean, we don't even know if we'll be here tomorrow, Greg. So. That is absolutely right, which is a reminder why we should go to break so we can make sure we get this stuff that will change segment yes. in. Yes. Waffle House. Bang in a second. Oh, back in a second. Oh, Waffle House. That'll be there. That never goes away. Mm -mm. Back on NFL Daily, and in the time that we went on break, we all survived. We're uh, still here. <laughs> Made it. But unfortunately, Marcus Valdez Scantling's employment with the Buffalo Bills did not survive. So that nope. the news, which would have been part of that whole Bills conversation uh, that we learned, a free agent pickup that did not work out. Things that will change. Yes, for the Bills, Marcus. I still was right. The Bills roster still did change from the time you, we You were so right. You were you were prescient. Were you annoyed actually that they stepped on? you looking very smart because if we had done this show yesterday mm -hmm. that the bills roster would change and amari cooper was traded the day after to the bills, the bills that, that's a win you. as a podcaster that's a win i am not you greg but <laughs> you're, i think you're projecting just a little bit <laughs> Yikes. i don't know i don't Yikes. know what's going on with you guys <laughs> Yikes. uh that was the news there a little bit of uh other housekeeping tom brady's officially a limited partner of the Oh, Las Vegas Raiders. good for him. We expected that. And Richard Seymour. Finally a win for Tom Brady. Tom Brady owns 5% of the team. Richard Seymour owns 0.5% of the team. And then one of Brady's business partners owns another 5%. So that actually adds up to a lot, 10.5%. That's not, that's not nothing. That's not like when they gave Serena and Venus Williams like 0.0001% oh. of the Dolphins along with Gloria Estefan. I don't know if that is still a thing. That if you go to the Dolphins website and you looked at the owner webpage, it always had a picture of Gloria Estefan. I always Venus. thought it was, is it Estefan or? Estefan. Estefan. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I always thought it was Estefan. I mean, I'm I don't know. not the person to ask about <laughs> correct pronunciations. Let's talk about stuff that will change. Okay. It, it was in my head because we just get to this point in the season and we think we know something about the NFL. And I just look at the NFL as a seasonal sport where November is going to be totally different than October. December is going to be totally different. You want to be peaking at the right time. But some of the things that we believe to be true now will no longer be true as we get further into the season. What is something that will change, Colleen Wolf? The Bears hype. The Bears Ooh. hype will Ooh. dissipate. <laughs> it will. It's at a boil right now. It's going to come down to a simmer. The Caleb Williams hysteria, that's probably never going to subside <laughs> because of I was going to make this segment. I'm not buying it like stuff that has hype, but I didn't want everyone to have to go negative all the time. But then you just came hard negative. I, well, I, I just it's like not, that. It's no, no, no. OK, it's not negative in. I have a reason for this because what, that you don't like hype them. Our no, producer? no, because of their <laughs> remaining schedule, they still have to play all of their division games. They have to play the Vikings twice, who are first in defensive DVOA. They have to play the Lions twice, who are fourth in defensive DVOA. The Niners, who are fifth in defensive DVOA. Obviously, the Packers, they have the Commanders, the Seahawks, and then like the Patriots and Cardinals. But this schedule is an absolute gauntlet. The NFC North in general, it's the first division since the merger to have every team with at least four wins through week six, it's a killer. So yes, I think that Caleb Williams deserves all, all of the accolades and all of the love that he's getting right now because he played a great game and he threw some absolutely beautiful balls and placed them where only he could for his receivers to get them and score, especially that one to Keenan Allen, the second touchdown, maybe that was his best pass of the entire season. Mm. But the hype is going to diminish a bit because the schedule is really, really difficult. Okay, so it's just more about the schedule. I, I think that's true of this. So we can kind of combine ours because, yeah, mine was the NFC North in general being this good. And part of the reason that they have the top four teams in terms of point differential for the first time ever through six weeks is they haven't played each other at mm -hmm. all. So that's just like a quirk in the schedule. But you're right. Other than the Vikings, who have somehow gone undefeated despite playing Sad. like a brutally difficult... Sam I mean, Darnold didn't really look that great. No. no. We might I have mean, to it, have it, a it is funny that, quarterback like, island. We're going to have to have another couple. Oh, right. No. It is funny that they have the number one defense in all stat stats. They have the number one, like, running game in a lot of different stats. Like, their passing game is, like, solid, and Sam Darnold still gets all the credit. But I no, can't wait until they go to the Super bitter. Bowl. And we're like, I just I still am not buying the Vikings. <laughs> I have loved... 
I have loved how steady and consistent Brian Flores' defense has looked. I think that defense, unlike probably some, like, for example, the Bears' defense gives me a little bit of pause when you talk about being built to play when it gets way colder, when teams are running the mm. ball more, when they're running heavier against you. Um, but I think that Brian Flores and that defense has showed, even though we are we talk so much about the crazy pressures and those types of things, I think that he is mal- malleable enough and flexible enough. Um, and, and Jeff Halfley's defense is starting to look pretty good as well. Yeah, so that, w- that was actually part of my reasoning that the NFC North can't stay this good this long, is that they have 17 turnovers this year. <laughs> they forced 17 turnovers. And that was an idea that they talked about in the offseason. So maybe you can really coach up turnovers, but that feels unsustainable. They actually have some pretty big holes, I would say, in their defense. Their pass rush really hasn't worked. They're, they're starting to play more rookies on their defense, and I think that could help them long term. But secondary linebacker, I think they have holes on every level, but it's been covered up by just this crazy turnover rate. And so that's part of the NFC North equation. The schedule was a big part of it, though. Mm-hmm. So the, the Bears have had the 31st, uh, the second easiest schedule really? in the league so far, and they go to the hardest schedule in the league mm-hmm. moving forward. But that's kind of great, though, for Caleb yes. to kind of ease him in because it is unfair to him. It's not like he can control all of the attention that he's getting, and he needs time to grow and develop. No, and he's going to be, the next three weeks, they have the Commanders, which, you know, for an offense is not a hard matchup, and then the Patriots and the Cardinals. So two like three of the worst defenses in the league in a row. So they could really keep getting fat, and Mm -hmm. then it gets brutal. But they're not the only team where it's similar to that. The Lions have had the 20th um, schedule in the league, like, you know, easy. They're going to have the second hardest moving forward. The Packers have been right in the middle of the pack so far, the third hardest moving forward. Now, part of that is just, like, everyone's got to play the Vikings, and the Vikings are a load. I think the Lions can withstand and hold up. I think the Packers need to keep getting better and they are a team that you would believe will but I do think their defense might be a little unsustainable and it's hard how can four can we really have four good teams in the same division maybe we can maybe have four teams over 500 it's pretty exciting the Lions are the best team in the NFC and then I mean when they the Packers as long as they have a healthy Jordan Love they're going to be relevant and obviously, Sam Darnold and those Vikings are 5-0. Yeah. It's just such a good division. So it's, it's more, yeah, a big part of it is just they're going to have to start facing each other. And, mm-hmm. and they, they lucked out in the scheduling, just what, what divisions they had to play. We thought the AFC South was going to be improved this year, and it's, it's not. And so that's really helped them as an out-of-division schedule. What do you got next? Jordan, you give me something that'll change. One thing that I think will change is Jerry Jones's general demeanor and vibe with a certain Dallas radio station, mm. um, his regular 105.3 <laughs> The Fan. So he does this regularly all throughout the season and offseason. That interview got extremely heated, and we do have the audio of that. Your job isn't to let me go over all the reasons that I did something, and I'm sorry that I did it. That's not your job. Well, my job is to so ask why. Get a job, or I'll get another. I'll get somebody else to ask these questions, man. Jerry Jones will fire you, even if he doesn't work for the company. Does he own the company? Well, your partners. If you're, if they're your radio partner, it's kind of like, does NBC work for the NFL? Not exactly, right. but you know, there's. It's a symbiotic relationship where they Ooh. have influence, certainly on who's you know, hired and who is. Yeah. And let's not forget how open and amenable he is generally to doing any interview, anything. He loves the spotlight. Yeah. And, and even at league meetings today, a couple of the national reporters who were there were talking about how he walked in way later than he normally does and then politely declined to, to speak with media because he was going to be late for the meeting, even though he's always early and he always holds court for, you know, even at times, multiple hours it's it's tough he's he's going through it right now it's not just that it was the loss to the lions that we were just talking about on his 82nd birthday it's not that they got blown out it's that they lost to a team that has no issues shape-shifting into a variety of different forms who are essentially like comfortable just playing with their food at the end of the game as he sat there and watched and it's also that the cowboys feel like they're helmed by coaches and have structured their team um, who feel like the foundation and future or the, the lines are helmed by coaches who feel like the foundation and future of a franchise while the Cowboys sort of feel like lame ducks 
from a bygone era and they're struggling. The best player's injured. The game's iced by your quarterback. who You're asking to do everything at the line of scrimmage. And you're still making him throw blind into the sun because you can't put a curtain <laughs> over the ceiling. It's, it is, it is, it's a lot of things that are there's that are making people Cur- very, you want, the, you want a curtain tight. over the side of the stadium. No, no, that's an option. There is one that yeah. exists that can be curtains there. That, <laughs> <laughs> very good. But I'm just saying there's a reason for him feeling like this right now for bristling when people I think are fairly and rightfully questioning him for all of the either decisions they did make or the decisions they didn't make, including the lame duck situation that it feels like in so many areas of this franchise, inclusive to the coaching staff. I would be angry too. If my team couldn't run the ball, couldn't stop the run. I had no home field advantage when before that was the main thing. Mm. There's no real identity. There's so many injuries. There's a lot every week. They're always like, we just got to practice better. Our practices haven't been great. And like McCarthy will say that too. And Ooh, and like, those are your practices, bro. Their, their offensive line, though, is the beginning of... It's why I don't think they have a very... Like, even if everything went right the rest of the year, Zimmer... I think their defense... Speaking of things that could change, like, if you told me that their defense is average or better in December, I wouldn't be shocked. Yeah, they're missing so many they, They're people. missing so many people, yeah. and it's a new system, and, it, and it's a coaching staff... Uh, a coach that hasn't been in the league for a minute. His system, I, I could see that, that there's room for improvement. I think the offensive line might be cooked. Zach Martin is a is a problem for them right now. He's a future Hall of Famer coming off the worst game, I, I think, of his career. Some people are wondering if he's fully healthy, but whatever it is, they've probably got four weak spots right now on an offensive line that used to be what they were all about. And now they've got Tyler Smith. He's a really good player. And four problem areas and that's something I don't I don't know if there's a solution don't you think the optics of this though are what I was texting you a little bit about this over the weekend with in reference to another another coach is like in another building it's like don't you think the optics here this is you lose to this team not just that you're that you lose lose but you lose to this team that they're doing whatever they want to do against you from a variety of different concepts and ideas and then there's all these cuts to the sideline of this young, uh, younger, energetic and galvanizing head coach who clearly has his Mm -hmm. entire team just like living and dying with him and then cuts to the the hotshot offensive coordinator on the side of the screen who's basically like, I'm only going to read one of my plays off this play card and and try to get a touchdown to an offensive lineman and literally play with his food and there's camera shots to this guy who is the future of this league on the sideline and you're sitting there in your box looking freaking miserable. Like I think the optics have to be bothering him. What too. a terrible birthday. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that, that it was the most embarrassing loss you could have. I mean, I don't think it helps if we're going that far that a long time Dallas Cowboys captain is yeah, coaching the lions. Right. <laughs> Not only that, but he was the protege of the guy that you supposedly have been pining over forever. Sean Payton. And so you missed many it. Layers. Yes. There's, there's, so there's much. a lot of layers there's here. Anyway, that's the reason for the tone. Okay. <laughs> I, I love that. All right. Let's go around one more time quickly. Stuff that will okay. change. The Bengals will rise from the dead like that. They are sub 500 right now, but they are just too good. Joe Burrow's too good. They're eighth in offensive DVOA. I mean, the offense is 10th in scoring 12th in yards per game. And that that's doing it without T Higgins for every single game. I mean, maybe the defense, it, maybe this was a turning point. I know that they were playing the giants, but maybe this is just good for an ego boost. uh, At this point, even marginally better for the Bengals defense would be an improvement and their schedule, they have some softballs coming up. I mean, they have the Raiders. They have the Browns twice. The Titans, who are a good defense, though. The Cowboys, the Eagles, which we just don't know what those <laughs> it's teams It's funny that the Cowboys are. and the Eagles now look like food. It's so weird. <laughs> um, so, you know, if the Steelers start messing around with Russell Wilson and losing games, then the Bengals could probably chase them at the end of the season. Lo- love that makes total sense to me. I, the Wesseling brothers and I were, were texting over the weekend. Ev- everyone is getting more optimistic about the Bengals That's good. already. I think it's going to happen. I, I'm going to find a glimmer of hope here in what Justin Herbert did over the weekend to the Broncos and say, Justin Herbert is not going to be playing 
conservative ball for the rest of the year. That the real Justin Herbert is going to come out. He's going to be allowed to come out from Blossom. Jim Harbaugh. Oh, what a celebration it would be. <laughs> in this game, yes. Uh, he's just like a beautiful little he's butterfly. He's, he's ready to come out of his cocoon. Ooh, I like that. Ooh. He, he could be a con- candidate in a couple weeks. So they've had him under lock and key. Part of it is the mindset of how they want to play offense. But I think the bigger part of it is he was just so injured. That bye week was really important for him. And I think it really showed up on film this last week. Not only that he was a different player, but that they treated him like a different player. So more dropbacks, more yards, more plays outside the pocket, more planting his feet and going down the field, more mid-range throws, more deep throws. He just looked like Justin Herbert again. So I think people maybe attributed so much of the beginning of the year to oh, the Chargers are just going to play this really boring style. That, that was a part of it, but I think it was just he was so banged up, and now we're going to see the real Justin Herbert. I love Herbert this for him, stretch. but I really love it for you, Greg. Yes, I didn't need much. I I lo- it's, it's bringing you back to life after your travels, I think. <laughs> it's, it's lovely. It's reanimating, see. Greg. All right, r- wrap us up, Jordan. <laughs> yeah, quickly, I, I do think, so I don't want to undermine or, or um, undersell like how brutal this Aiden Hutchinson loss is. First of all, horrific to watch hate it for that young man for the entire team for the organization for his long journey ahead but actually after they sort of emotionally recover from this situation um i still think this defense will ultimately keep ascending and so the Mm. the initial panic that everyone's feeling right now because of the severity of that situation and of course you're losing the top pass rusher in the league right now but after that subsides i think that then you'll start to feel some hope and optimism about this defense because every single week they're growing. I think they have the ability on the interior of their defensive line to sort of change around the identity. One of their guys, uh, uh, a couple of their players actually have some position flex where you could pop them out a little bit wider and they're also getting good pressure. Um, They are, you know, 17 and 16 pressures between Onuzurike and Aleem McNeil and respectively, which is 11th and 14th among interior defensive line. And you can actually manufacture a little bit more pressure coming from that area. And as you see this secondary start to come to life, start to settle in, I think Brian Branch, in an age right now that we're in, that is becoming truly golden for safety play, where these safeties can do everything, they are letting Brian Branch do everything, and he is showing up. I really have faith in Aaron Glenn as a defensive coordinator, and I think he'll keep this group on track and ascending into what is going to about is about to be a very difficult backstretch for the entire NFC North. It, it's a good call because he's very creative at making up for what they're missing, and yeah, I I don't want to hear that they're under talented because they've poured a lot of resources, yep. a lot of draft picks, a lot of money developing. into that. They've done defense. such a good job, right? And so they can scheme around it. I also think they might add someone, you know, in the next couple of yeah, weeks. Yeah, I could say. Well, they did. They picked some uh, pass rusher. <laughs> yeah. They picked No, I think that rusher. would make a lot of sense. I know. Yeah, I do think so as well. And they also picked up, I'm going to have to go back and look at it. They're they're scouring practice squads for depth for rotational outside linebackers as but well. But maybe right like a, a bigger name, like a Reddick, they would make sense for. I, I did look for some potential trade games. We might do a whole show on this later in the month, but just for we now. We should just do it now. I see. Just <laughs> Yeah, what time now. are we at? <laughs> I think is Jeffrey Simmons ever going to be available? Harold Landry, Jadevian Clowney, Chase Young, maybe from the Saints if they bottom out. The the trick is you got to find a team that's bottom bottoming out. Zadarius Smith, I think, would make a lot of sense from the Browns. So just someone. I think the Lions yeah. will probably add someone that makes sense. at some point. All right, we're gonna take one quick break and then we will wrap up talking T and F. It is time for your door to more presented by DoorDash. That's our TNF preview. I was so excited about Broncos Saints a few weeks ago. (laughs) I'm still really excited, but in in a different way. Unfortunately, it's a little ghoulish. It's it's just wondering what could happen if the Saints don't win this game. Broncos coming in after a humbling performance of their own where they were down 23 to nothing. They made it look a little better at the end against the Chargers, but that was a little bit of a comeback to earth game for them. After a week in Denver where I was following a lot of these Broncos beat writers and they're like, here's why the Broncos are going to make the playoffs. And oh, I was thinking, no. oh, hold on. Then again, Colleen, they could very easily be four and three after this week because they are playing a Saints team that has injuries just 
everywhere. Not just yeah. three offensive linemen, not just Chris Olave, which I mentioned on the Monday night recap show with Nick Shook. Rashid Shahid is very possibly missing this game with a knee injury. Oh so God. we're talking about Spencer Rattler throwing to Bub Means and Cedric Wilson as his top wideouts. I hate it, that for it, Spence. Against a great defense. Pretty which name which, combination. Yeah. Spencer Rattler to Bub Means. Yeah. I love that. And it kind of worked <laughs> yeah. on Sunday, yeah, actually. It, it was Bub Means' first real action as a pro, and it was one of those things where those two guys were throwing to each other a lot in training camp as, like, the right. third stringers, and now they're starting. And Rattler overall he looked was good in the first interesting. Half. Now, this is a Broncos defense that will probably not have Patrick Sertain, who also suffered a concussion on Sunday, so that's unfortunate. But they're going to throw a lot of blitzes at a bad Saints offensive line and a, and a rookie quarterback. That's a tough recipe for the Saints. Yeah, I was just looking at the fact that you have two rookie quarterbacks starting and then two key players in concussion protocol, one on each team in Sertan and Chris Olave. Um, the Broncos offense has been tough to watch. They <laughs> are um, really struggling, almost shut out at home. But but and Bo Nix intercepted on his first attempt in that game. Just really set the tone for the rest of the day. Really nixed the play. Really, truly. Hey now. They have no run game, no pop whatsoever. So it's either going to be a really good day for the Saints defense, who just gave up 51 points minus the one uh, fumble return to the Bucks, or um, a really bad day for the Saints <laughs> at home in a game that Sean Payton, the Sean Payton Invitational. So it, it's it's going to be tough. I, I don't know. I don't know if, obviously, on a short week with concussion protocol, I don't think that these guys will be available for the game. I wouldn't expect them to be. No, and, and yeah, Sean Payton, you know, and meeting New Orleans again, and he said earlier this week, you know, he's not expecting warm fuzzies and, but to be put, you know, in the, in the sense that he's expecting the Saints fan base to rise to the occasion like they so often do. And and it's it's interesting because this could be a chaos game in oh, I love a chaos in just game. great, sloppy, but interesting ways. I mean, you're going to see two young quarterbacks, I think, really work through some stuff <laughs> in real time right now. Spencer Rattler is dealing with an offensive line and particularly a center combination they've had. Four different linemen play at least 50 snaps at center this season, which is the most of the NFL in the NFL. Mm. They're rolling him out a lot where actually he's throwing the ball pretty well on these designed rollouts in order to um, sort of mitigate some of the extra pressure that he's seeing, which you know that the Broncos, even minus Pat Sertain, um, locking down so much area of the field. So you are able to send all these extra players and was playing at a defensive player of the year candidacy candidacy profile to me, um, even without him, I think they're going to try to get after Spencer Rattler as much as they can. On the other side, I think the Saints are going to have to try to manufacture some stuff against Bo Nix as well. And the Saints defense is, especially if Bo Nix goes on the move, uh, they're kind of missing tackles in, in mm -hmm. sketchy big spots right now. Their linebackers were terrible. That was a humbling loss for Dennis Allen and the Saints. Yeah. He's supposed to be a defense. He is a defensive coach. He's been building this up. He was, this was the whole vision of keeping Dennis Allen, who was the coordinator under Sean Payton for such a long time at the end of Payton's run. The vision was, we're going to keep this side of the ball as our steadying force and we'll figure it out on offense. They obviously haven't. That's why they hired Clint Kubiak this off season to run the offense. But now you're seeing some real decay on their defense. The secondary is very talented. Marshawn Lattimore is having a fantastic year. Overall, the secondary hasn't been their issue, but their linebacker play, Demario Davis is one of their best players, but it's almost like it got contagious. All their linebackers aren't making tackles. Cameron Jordan isn't as involved as he used to be in terms of playing. And yeah, I mean, this Broncos offensive line for the most part has been good this year. And if Dennis Allen gets embarrassed by another, by like a rookie quarterback at home, Sean Payton, it's an interesting organization in that I think Mickey Loomis has more power than just about any non-owner in the NFL now that Pete Carroll and Bill Belichick are out of the league. Mm. I think something really drastic and dramatic would have to happen for him to really get the attention of his boss ownership. Losing to Sean Payton 
And, That'll do it. Yeah, losing to Sean Payton, and I don't think it would be something where it would ever be in the middle of the season. That just doesn't strike me as something the Saints would do. But it would be maybe the start of something of like, wow, this is not going well. Because, frankly, I think they have the more talented rookie quarterback. I'm taking Spencer Rattler long-term Agenda. over Bo Nix. Come are, at me. Are you taking the Saints this week? I think I will. I haven't thought about that yet. Uh, I guess we should as part of this. <laughs> Good thing we're I'm, in this. Well, my you, official you, picks come you on. just got back. It's on, fine. On it's game right. day view <laughs> later in the week. By the way, ripped off a perfect record last week. A perfect? While what? I was over in no. 14 and 0. Let's go. Let's go. Good job. It was Man, kind of a cho- chalky week where it's like machine. favorites <laughs> reigned. I'm still, Cynthia's still beating me, you know, overall, but good week. I I think I would take them just because I want to root for it. We're having the guys from the Saints Block Party podcast on live on YouTube oh, cool. after this game. Book that months ago, you know, thinking this is the game to have them. It's going to be <laughs> crazy. And I think it will be fun. So it's either going to be like a funeral for the Saints team because I think they become sellers at the trade deadline if they go to two and five here. But if they win, they're three and four and the division's not amazing. At least you're like still in the mix and you could hope that you get some players back healthy and get better as the course of the season goes on. I am going to pick the Broncos here. Uh, I am really looking forward to that live recap because uh, (laughs) win or lose, first of all, those guys have predicted so much of what's actually happened this Mm. season for the Saints, but also I loved when you had them on earlier because um, they just are so plugged in to their team and they're also hilarious. And if, if it's a chaos game, like I'm personally hoping for, I can't wait to hear their thoughts about that and what the future of this team is looking f- uh, moving forward. But yeah, I, I'm going to pick the Broncos in this. I think that Sean Payton, it, it's like, you know, just enough juice, you know, the, the old cyclist, you know, who's in the Tour de France or whatever. And like, you got just enough juice to do the one giant mountain, you know, and then you're, then you're out. <laughs> then you, you're by done. juice, do you it. mean like illegal substances that you're injecting into your body through like a complicated you know, formula and whatnot? Or no, that's I, not what you're talking about. I don't mean that, no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you say juice and you say cycling. That's what I think. I'm taking the Saints. Okay. Oh, was- look at that. <laughs> Yeah, that was what the face was for, Greg. I was not figuring out why you were making that face at me. And now I understand. Got it. Got Saints it. and Broncos <laughs> on Thursday night. I'm wondering, like, what is, what is the point spread in this game? The Broncos are favored by two points on the road. I thought it might be by more. Yeah. But when you can't really throw the ball too well. And your can't, defense can't get off the field. I think they will on Sunday. I, I mean, on Thursday night, rather. They have a good defensive line. My heart is saying Saints. My head is saying Broncos. It's more important to lead with your heart. So I'll stick with them. (laughs) Thanks for watching NFL Daily presented by DoorDash. Thank you guys for giving me that juice today. Oh, you're welcome, But not the cycling juice. Not the, nothing (laughs) illegal about it. We will be back on Thursday with our preview show. Special guest this week, Steve Weiss is still over in London. So joining Patrick Claybon and I will be none other than Brian Baldinger. Oh, Baldy. he's a Baldy. Love that. He's on the show. That's great. That's going to be so yeah. good. When you're talking about a Dennis Allen team collapsing, you know football is back. <laughs>